Hello everyone and welcome to the second half of your adolescent pediatrics lecture with me, Dr. Melissa Ompico. I'm a general pediatrician and one of the several faculty comprising the PEDIA department. We are only going to virtually meet a few times this year during your PEDIA 1, but I hope to get to see you more during your PEDIA 2 rotation and hopefully we're going to meet face to face sooner rather than later. For teens, as well as us, there are a lot of distractions in online education. How many times did we kid ourselves at watching a few TikToks or playing 15 minutes of ML for relieving stress eventually ended in the wee hours of the morning with the modules left unfinished? If this is not particularly bothering you, then you are on time with your modules and classwork. That makes you a hero, a mojo. Legend. So in reality, just like with teens, we can sit in front of our gadgets long enough if we are motivated enough. That we can recover from a failure and make a grand viral comeback. I hope you have the same attitude in your schoolwork in our virtual encounters. In comparison to the lecture slides of Dr. Domingo, this afternoon's lectures are lengthier. Does it make you feel overwhelmed, coupled with the uncertainties of medical education in the pandemic times? Just as confused and feeling inadequate as we are, the feelings of confusion, stress, and anxiety is amplified a hundredfold for an adolescent who is experiencing many bodily, hormonal, and psychological changes for the first time in a seemingly very volatile, invasive, and harsh world. Having discussed the physiology and expected changes of normal adolescent anatomy and behavior last week, our lecturers will cover more on the pathologic portion of adolescent pediatrics. As a review, when does growth spurt occur in female adolescents? When is menstruation expected to occur? And when is menarche considered First delayed? Blood. On the average, growth velocity is at its highest for height at Tanner stage 3, during which acne and body odor become prominent, whereas the weight accelerates and peaks at Tanner stage 4. Menstruation should have already occurred at Tanner stage 4, but a few won't until Tanner stage 5, and the age range for the occurrence of these signs are indicated below. In our slides today, we will take the point of view of a confused teen, and some of the concerns and false beliefs here might have been your own when you were younger, or even up until now. Body image and appearance is definitely a huge concern for teens, especially females. Have you ever found yourself in this situation? We know that the breast bud heralds the onset of puberty in females, but not all breast sizes are the same. Minor breast asymmetry is also common. On the extreme side, the absence or hypoplasia of the breast associated with other anatomic defects might be a clue to a syndrome, but this is rare. On the other side of the spectrum, Abnormalities of supernumerary breasts or nipples are also rare but are associated especially with cardiovascular and genitourinary abnormalities. Some teens who may be considered more gifted with virginal hypertrophy may suffer from back pain, bullying, and psychological issues, and thus over time will be problematic, even more so with age. Legendary! Lumps in the breasts are mostly benign in teens and cancer is rarely a concern, but it does happen, albeit only rarely. Among these two most common benign masses, 
majority consist of fibroadenomas. Both vary in size during the menstrual cycle and become larger immediately before the period or menses. Diagnostics do differ. Remember that mammography as an imaging modality is almost never used in teens due to the dense nature of the breast tissue and its size. Breast pain is often a chief complaint in several teen checkups, and most often, all that is needed is reassurance that it will pass over time. The careful explanation for this pre-period cycling pain must be elaborated on. The varying levels of hormones cause proliferative changes, but will recede, hence considered physiologic and not a herald for anything particularly life-threatening. However, the struggle is real, and the treatment we can advise are the following. Discharges may also be alarming in a careful history should identify the etiology. Is the teen pregnant but hiding it? Is the discharge coupled with severe headaches and vision problems? Then, prolactinoma must be ruled out. Looking at the characteristics of the discharge, is it greenish and smelly, suggestive of an infection? Or serosanguinous or bloody? We should rule out malignancy. Common factors like local stimulation, some medications, stress, and thyroid problems can also cause discharges. Let us watch this short video. The woman on the left is shocked and envious that this muscular guy's breasts are larger than hers. This case is... I must, I must improve my bust, I must that's right, gynecomastra. For teens, it is quite common to experience transient gynecomastra and will occur in two-thirds of all healthy, normal adolescent males. Aside from enlargement and tingling pain, it is important to elicit a family history that may reveal similar experiences for males in the family. Many are afraid to consult, though, for fear and stigma. If they do, counsel them that it should gradually resolve over 1.5 to 2 years. If the enlargement is significant, though, there are medications that can be tried after ruling out all other problems like endocrine and liver disease, neoplasms, chronic disease conditions, syndromes, and even trauma. There are medications that induce gynecomastia and we've made a neat acronym to help you remember. Obviously, the case of the preceding video is a case of a drug-induced one, particularly overdosing on anabolic steroids in the attempt to grow muscle mass. So guys, please be careful about what you take. Some variety of menstrual dysfunction occurs at some time in about 75% of adolescent females. Although most of the problems are minor, severe dysmenorrhea or prolonged menstrual bleeding can be debilitating. In most cases, they are mild and patient explanation and reassurance is needed to emphasize their reproductive normalcy. How soon will my menses occur? At what age? Why is my period irregular? Fears of the unfamiliar are fueled by many local beliefs and myths, even in this age of technology. Have you ever seen Facebook posts recommending that drinking beer or pineapple will induce menstrual bleeding in amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea? Fallacies Let us review the so-called normal values in menstruation. Back then, it was usually a pain to ask menstrual history during patient interviews. But thankfully, now there are many apps that can be used to track the intervals of the periods, mark the date of the last menstrual period, and even record the volume subjectively. It is paramount to ask for maternal menarche as there is maternal daughter concordance in the age of the first menses. Generally, if two cycles have passed outside this range of normal 
or skipping their periods for three consecutive months, evaluation is required. Important information to elicit also include the weight of the patient, the level of exercise she does, and chronic medical conditions. Historically, abnormalities in volume, intervals, and regularity were designated with these terminologies. There are a lot to memorize, I know. So please just read over them for additional information as these are no longer used extensively. But it might be useful during rounds, by the way. A newer generalized umbrella term has now been generally used. The term AUB or abnormal uterine bleeding. So that term is meant to describe either those menstrual or intermenstrual problems. The subclassification of AUB are many, but more significantly in our age population of interest are the AUBOs, which refer to menstrual irregularities caused by the immaturity of the pituitary hypothalamic ovarian axis causing an ovulation. An ovulation. AUBOs usually occur shortly after menarche and may manifest either as intermittent bleeding, very long intervals of bleeding, to as extreme as amenorrhea, or very fidgety and uh, complicated to handle, or excessive bleeding. Hence, the differentials are a mix of the following. And these... Girls, I don't know why you still be having periods when you can just hold it in. I've been holding mine in for like eight months. I do be getting kind of fat though, but... Remember this, that the most common cause of a missed period is still pregnancy. Amenorrhea is either primary or secondary. Primary, meaning the teen has never had menarche by age 15 years or it has already been three years after the onset of puberty and still no menses. Secondary amenorrhea is when the regular interval is interrupted for three supposed cycles already. Nelson's textbook of pediatrics 21st edition summarizes the causes in tables 142.2 and 142.3. Yes kids, it's time you open those books. In primary, some of them are caused by genetic, systemic, or structural defects, as in the case of imperforate hymen. But also, look at the family history for maternal or sibling age for menarche, as it may be the reason for delayed onset of menses. Others are nutrition and activity-related conditions. The FAT, or female athlete triad, is characterized by 1. Amenorrhea, Two, disordered eating, and three, osteoporosis. These are common in those engaging in strenuous exercises and sports and competitive dancing like ballet. Anorexic patients also commonly experience amenorrhea. On the other hand of the spectrum, look for symptoms of rapid growth, obesity, hirsutism, or a dark pigmentation on the neck area if PCOS is suspected. To help you remember, think of the acronym hair and Hyperandrogenism, irregular periods, and acanthosis nigricans. Tumor of note that may cause amenorrhea are the following. Diagnostics are therefore varied depending on the possible etiology being entertained. So start with a pregnancy test and HCG or beta-HCG levels in a normal or routine pelvic exam. A hormone assay and ultrasound are especially useful for amenorrhea as seen in this flowchart. TSH, prolactin, FSH, and an ultrasound can rule in or rule out thyroid diseases, a prolactinoma, and anatomic disorders. If FSH is low or normal, consider a deficiency in 
or something that is affecting the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis or maybe a hyperandrogenic disorder. If FSH is elevated, consider end organ dysfunction or sensitivity as in the case of ovarian insufficiency due to a variety of causes. If confirmation or further investigation is needed, repeat FSH may be done, evaluate also for autoimmune disorders, determine the karyotype, and others. In excessive bleeders, consider assessing the adequacy of platelets, coagulation functionality, as well as rule out infections. AUBs with excessive bleeding can lead to life-threatening anemia, inappropriate transfusion and giving of hormones are the treatment of choice. For those who refuse hormones though, especially if contraindicated like, remember how you can't use estrogen in hypercoagulable states? Tranexamic acid can be used. In AUBC, address the coagulopathy. Maybe it's a factor 8 deficiency or a von Willebrand factor disease. For athletes, anorexics, and PCOS patients with amenorrhea, lifestyle changes and weight management are holistic and therapeutic. The administration of metformin can be helpful in insulin resistance and obesity in PCOS. Dok, may kumakalat po kasi sa FB now na masama ang pagligo kapag may period through po ba? Hi ma'am, sagutin po natin ang inyong katanungan. Ito po ay hindi totoo at isang myth lamang. Ang paliligo tuwing may buwan ng dalaw ay safe para sa ating mga kababaihan. Sa katunayan, nire-recommenda po namin mga doktor ang paghugas at paliligo with warm water dahil makakatulong po ito to relieve the menstrual cramps or yung pananakit ng puson. Ang advice lamang po namin is to regularly wash your genitals with water and mild soap. Iwasan po natin yung paggamit ng mga soap with harsh chemicals and strong fragrances. Kasi maaari po nitong madisturb yung bacterial balance or pH ng ating genitals, which will make us more prone to infection. Plus, hygiene is really important. So yes, pwedeng-pwede po tayong maligo kapag may buwan ng dalaw. Avoiding baths and cold weather to prevent dysmenorrhea is definitely a myth. A lot of teen girls experience dysmenorrhea and unfortunately, they may not be looking for answers in the right places. We need to explain to them how menstrual pain is often primary. That the cyclic withdrawal of progesterone results in synthesis of prostaglandins by the endometrium which stimulates local vasoconstriction uterine ischemia, and pain, and smooth muscle contraction, explaining both the uterine and GI symptoms. Because of the association with ovulation, primary dysmenorrhea typically presents at least 12 uh, months from the menarche. Crampy pelvic pain may be accompanied by aching or heaviness in the lower back and upper thigh, Nausea, emesis, diarrhea, headache, nostalgia, fatigue, and dizziness. Symptoms begin at or shortly before the onset of menstrual flow and last one to three days. The secondary and usually more pathologic types are caused by the following. Young women don't have to suffer not taking baths for days but they should instead be prescribed analgesics, particularly NSAIDs. Remember how your lectures in pharmacology describe that they inhibit the cyclooxygenase pathway in prostaglandin, and prostaglandin being the culprit or the source of the pain in dysmenorrhea? Examples of medications that can be useful include ibuprofen, naproxen, or even celecoxib. Secondly, a trial of combined or progestin hormonal treatment can be done using GnRH agonists or antagonists. And last and least, surgery can be an option. Adjuncts like herbal medications, supplements, acupressure, and aromatherapy may be anecdotally effective but less superior than those recommended medical treatment above. 
Are Please you mad? Drown. Are you mad? No. Are you grumpy? No. Are you sad? No. Are you angry? No. What are you? I don't know. Several days before the menses, 30% of adolescents will experience premenstrual syndrome or PMS. It can be observed by others as having mood swings or needing time alone. Feelings of bloatedness and pain everywhere, food cravings, and or poor concentration. PMS is precipitated by ovulation. Symptoms occur in the luteal phase and should disappear at the end of menstruation. Take note that our references will cite that exercise, relaxation, and stress management, education, and counseling are all that is needed to solve this problem. Strange, but true. Combined hormonal therapy can be used only if there are other coexisting problems like AUB or dysmenorrhea. We must rule out the possibility though of the condition being a PMDD or a premenstrual dysphoric disorder which can be experienced by some 2-5% to of menstruating females. This is a distinct DSM-5 criteria illness for this, in comparison to PMS, the symptoms are much more marked and interference with work or school is pervasive. SSRIs may need to be given particularly fluoxetine as well as counseling and psychiatric support. Let's take a short break, walk around the room, drink some water and breathe some fresh air. See you in the next video! Victory!